So I'm just going to demonstrate how to look at video reference for animation and how to record what you see to help make a timing plan for your animation. I have this reference file that I recorded recently for my students, and it just demonstrates a number of different balls bouncing across the floor. And I provided at the top a time code as well as frame numbers and what the frame rate was filmed at. That's a pretty important feature of getting animation timing accurately. You need to know what was the frame rate it was reported at, and you need to be able to count the frames if you want to get very accurate timing information. If you're not able to do that, then you're stuck estimating. And until you have a certain amount of experience animating and timing things, your estimates are going to be way off and they're going to be very, very hard to rely upon. And so I strongly suggest that you try to use frame by frame animation reference, write down the frame number, and then use that as a basis to judge your future guesses. We're going to go ahead and go back in this. And I just want to demonstrate that YouTube's capable of looking at frame by frame video. If you pause the video and use on your keyboard, the left and right arrow keys, it jumps back a few seconds. So I'm trying to see how many seconds that is 43 to 38. So about five second gaps, it looks like. But if you use period and comma instead, um, and I think the reason for that is that there's the greater than or less than above that. But if you use period or comma, you can see I can tap one frame at a time, and that's going to help us get our reference. So I'm going to go back, hit play with space bar. As soon as I see green, hit space again to pause it, and then step forward to where I throw it, and we see the apex of the first bounce right here. This is the uppermost point. It never goes higher than that. So that would be the first frame that I want to record for my animation. We can see over here that we're at 620. So I've got this little um, spreadsheet where I've entered in a formula to help me do this quickly. But really, you could just write these down on a piece of paper or in an open Photoshop document or something if you want to write by hand and have it digital. Um, what I've got here is I enter in the start frame, so that'd be 620. And then every frame after that is just adding one. So the formula, if you want to write your own, is equals that first cell plus one and then just drag it with the little drag down and it should be the previous frame so this one was uh, a2 this is a3 a4 a5 etc and you can see the formula because you drag it will update so we're just getting one by one counting then this one is using the start frame and uh, a2 plus one so we're trying to subtract the original value from the start frame the start frame special and then add one to it so we're not starting on zero. And so that formula, A3 plus one minus start frame, A4 plus one minus start frame, that just goes down. I also had a place over here to input the frame rate. I'm missing it, there it is. And I named this field as well, but in this formula, it's not necessary to calculate that. I was gonna try to calculate the time code as well, but it turned out to be too difficult. So here we've got the start frame. Um, here we've got the adjusted frame, which is in our animation, because we don't want to start a timeline at 620. And then the fudge frames are when we want to adjust something by hand because we want to increase or decrease the timing for our own purposes. So these are manually input. Uh, then we've got an action field over um, here and any extra notes that you want to fill in. I've squeezed this all way over um, for the sake of screen clarity for you guys, but I would be typing in what I think is happening over here. So I'm going to squeeze this all way down so it's taking up less space. Like that. And so I'd probably write something like apex for this. So we're going to start on first apex. So I know that that's where my whole animation is going to begin. So back over here, let's go ahead and tap forward until it hits the ground. It can be a little hard to tell sometimes because of the blur or because of the frame rate, but we'll just say that's the one because after that, it's sort of recoiled back up into the air. So that's six, three, four, six, three, four. So frame 15 essentially is where that happens. And so we'll say first hit, and we don't really have to number them. I'm just doing that. So I'm going to go forward until I see it stop its momentum. So somewhere here, you may sometimes want to line your mouse up and then go forward and backward to see where the apex is. So it's right here, 643, 643. So that's frame 24. And we're going to say apex again. 
So something to note for your animation, though, is how far off the ground did this bounce? And also, how far is it traveling compared to the size of the ball? We want to make sure to make notes of that, at least mentally, or we can write them down. So if we back up, this is the distance that that traveled all the way to the ground. Uh, if you're working on Windows, you can actually use skip, uh, Snip and Sketch, which is included in the operating system, I believe, or it's just free to download, I'm not sure to screenshot what you're looking at and just draw right over the top of it. And it can be helpful, but it's not really necessary. So it was it would hit here on the ground, which is why I'm lining my mouse up there. I'm going to put my mouse where the ball is. We're going to go forward to the hit and then to the first return, 643. So that's the ratio we're talking about from this point, just above, let's say, the light switch, all the way down to here. And it looks to be about a third. I'll just say it's a third. So first hit apex, and then we'll say, ooh, there we go. apex, uh, one third return ratio. We want to kind of just maintain that one third return ratio. We don't want to rapidly change it over and over again, unless you've got some very strangely shaped ball, like um, the stitching on a baseball might affect that or something that deforms uh, like a water balloon. But we're going to try to maintain that. But we can try to observe, then, if this is the second apex, is it going to return about a third from there? So here's the next hit. And there's the next return. And maybe it does. It's closer to halfway, probably, maybe like two-fifths. But it's good enough to say that our one-third will work in this case. Uh, so let's get that second hit here. So six, five, one. So we'll say hit, then, oops, that was like a searching for something. I hit the wrong key. So we'll go forward until we see the apex, right about here, 657, apex. You could just say top and bounce, or top and bottom, or something like that, whatever is comfortable for you. Nicely, we have a, a sort of reflection in the floor. So right here, this is a weird thing. It looks like it kind of teeters or something. It stays on the ground twice. Because this one is still low, I think that maybe it was bouncing off the ground and bouncing towards the ground. We missed the frame. So you could pick either one. You could pick this one or this one. I'm just going to pick two, and then we'll fudge it if we need to uh, later. That's why I have that fudge column, because likely these numbers are good. But for animation, sometimes we need something a little bit more formulaic. I'll say 667 for our apex. You can see how spread out all this stuff gets. That's a definite hit there, 71. And then it's that 74. So we're getting down to the three frame gap or two frame gap now. Once we get low enough, all we can really do is use single frame gaps eventually. Six, six, seven. And at that point, we can just abandon this and see how long does it dribble on the ground? How long is it visibly vibrating up and down? It's like 80. So sometimes in these little bounces, it'll stay bouncing for a good long time. Uh, you don't have to have your animation roll to a stop every single time necessarily, but it could be a good idea to accelerate the, the diminishing at the end, just to kind of wrap up the animation, make sure that you don't have to keep animating for 10 seconds just to show up all dribbling. Eight, five. So see that one was like a three frame gap, whereas I had a two frame gap before. This is pretty typical, but we're, we're going to adjust all of this stuff to try to make the gap a little bit more consistent. So 8-7, I think, is a hit. And 8-8, eight, eight. it's like the very next frame. Two frames on. So I think you get the point. And now it would be, how long does it keep doing this? Let's say one. One more, really. OK, so that was almost at the end anyway. So from here, 90, I see 91. And then basically by 92, it's down. 
we'll say apex and hit and then we'll say also from this hit start roll and since it's a little light plastic ball it has this sort of wobbling roll but we're probably going to just animate this in two dimensions we'll say that it, it can exit frame any time out here but it exits frame still kind of rolling so we'll go 25 it's probably a good place to end it anyway say exit frame still so that'd be the end of our animation okay so we've got notes enough about where it's high and low across this time frame let's go ahead and go back five seconds let's play it So it's a lot of notes for a very little amount of action, but that's animation. You seem to travel slow motion through the events, and then when you play them back, they're over in a flash. And so if we want to have good detailed animation, we have to make note of that. There's lots of other things that you can make note of if you're a beginner, just watching the slow motion uh, path of the ball. The fact that it moves in an arc, that it rounds across the tops and reverses rapidly at the bottom, the amount of spacing between each frame as it moves, you don't have to copy every single position, and really you shouldn't copy every single position. You should try to extract principles from this and then form your own animation. So for instance, in the blur of the camera, how much distance is that ball appearing to cover in one blurred frame like that? Um, that's quite a distance. And so we could exaggerate the squash and stretch on that ball quite a lot, and it would look relatively normal because that's one of the purposes of squash and stretch is to simulate a camera blur. Or if you're going to do a blur effect, you can do that as well. Um, how quickly does it return back to a circular appearance? Right? Do we see any squish at the bottom of these contacts? And really the answer is no. I don't ever see squash down here at all. Um, so we could do stretch with no squash, or we could do stretch and just give it some squash anyway, or a sense of um, pliability. But really, you just never see it. So maybe it would be best to leave that out. You can also see the spacing between hits. So if we lined up on the ground, where does the ball strike? So here, then how far away does it strike the ground again? And you can compare that to the height of the bounce to get an idea of how much progression across the screen should it be making. It looks like it's traveling maybe about half as far as it's bouncing up. So I'm just gonna make a note of that uh, on this same spot right here. One third return ratio, traveling path of height. And that's just to get an idea of framing when I put it into Maya to move it around so I can set the camera up to capture this entire thing. Um, that's going to be another thing. You probably want to pose the ball first, then get the camera lined up in a nice position where it can see the entire thing. Um, but don't be surprised if it's rather small on the screen by that point. Uh, this is a small ball. And so this is a lot of distance to be traveling. You might want to do things like take a screenshot and measure how many heights of the ball is this down to the ground. Or you could estimate, but if you're not very good at spatial estimation, your animation could look very wrong. So I would say just at a, a round number, this is maybe something like 15 or 20 heights of that ball from the first bounce to the floor, which is quite a lot. And then that would mean going across, it's going to be something like 30 widths of the ball or something around there, 25, 30. Which means if my ball is one unit in size, I gotta be able to see about 25, 30 wide and about 20 tall to frame this entire animation correctly. Um, that's pretty small and it's gonna be, seem really strange at first, but that's right for this kind of ball to make it look like plastic, okay? So as many observations as you can about this sort of thing while you have it in front of you. And it's not unusual also to just have your animation reference open on the side while you're working in case you forgot to observe something properly. All right, so let's see, can I fudge these numbers just a little bit to uh, better reflect a pattern that I want to animate? With this first drop, 15 frames, the second portion of this is only 10 or nine. And that's a little asymmetric, it's a little bit odd, but this part right here is not a part of the symmetry of this first bounce because if you want to know what I'm talking about, let's back it up. This first bounce is half of a bounce, right? We only start here midair. We hit the ground. 
And so if we were to get one big symmetrical bounce, we'd have this other half of it where it started on the ground over here. And that's not what's happening. This bounce should be more symmetrical from frame 16 or adjusted. Sorry, I was reading the number from frame 15 to its apex to its hit. We should about, have about as much time traveling up as we do traveling down again, you know, in a perfect world with perfect recording. But of course, none of that's true. So that whole bounce. So if we take a look and do the math for it. So we go from 15 to 24. So that's nine. And then we go from 24 to 32. That's eight. So nine would have been here instead. We could adjust that to say our first entire bounce is nine. I don't think there's a need to adjust it that minutely. And so I'm just going to observe each one of these and see from 32 to 38, that's six from 38 to 30 or to 43. Sorry, that's five. That's okay. That's just one less. Then we've got 43 to 48, five, 48 to 52, four. That's one less. So it actually seems to be a pretty good holding pattern that there's one less frame on the um, descent of the ball. So then we've got this one. I can just see that one's symmetrical. Then this one is not, but again, it's one less on the um, on the latter half of the bounce. This one, again, two frames, then one. This one is one more, which is pretty strange. So I think I would move the apex to here instead. So I'm just going to move that to say that we had one frame gap and then one frame between apex and hit here. And we've got up and down, and this is where it sticks and then starts to roll. And then it exits frame. So we didn't really have to adjust the numbers very much. I just slid this one action so that I had less time on the descent than on the ascent. And that's all the fudging I'm really going to do. So now this ends up being a good plan. I actually use the, uh, the fudge frame column so that I can extract out the numbers and see them more easily because this is just an, a never ending line of numbers and I can't tell which ones are important. And so here I'm just going to write all of the relevant numbers in my fudge frames. That way I have a nice, easy to view list as I go in through and fill in all my animation frames in Maya. By the way, if you're new to animation, this might seem like a lot of work to do for something so simple. And yes, it is. But winging animation is a ruinous thing to do when you start out because you don't have any basis for making good guesses or good choices. Um, if you haven't observed a lot of uh, motion on video still frame, then you have no way to make your decisions. So this is how we start out um, observing things accurately so that we can make uh, important decisions and accurate decisions before we start using our intuition more. Um, it might so be that I put these poses into Maya and then I change a lot of them because when it plays back in Maya, it doesn't look right to me. That's okay, but I also have a lot of experience animating things and uh, observing things in motion on video. And so you want to be careful about just winging it. Animation is not something that you can just wing most of the time. Even though it can be fun, your results are not going to be very accurate. You're not going to be learning very much. You're just going to be, you know, trying to hope that it comes out OK in the end. And that's not usually the best way to learn. I also wanted to show that you can draw out your plan in a chart. And oftentimes that can be much easier to understand. And it's far more common. Uh, here I've just transposed all of our observations from my uh, spreadsheet down into this drawing, which starts with the ball up in the air and then labels every frame number at all of the various events. It does get crowded. And so just, you know, write them down however you want. You can do a, a smaller diagram of just sawtooth pattern or something. But since they're all crowded together, there's no need to continue drawing the ball over and over. Um, we just kind of need the path of the ball. When it gets to the characters, sometimes you're drawing little thumbnails of your characters instead of a path through the air. But in this case, a path through the air makes a lot of sense. Here I've given myself notes about how high off the ground the ball starts, about what sort of distance it's covering per bounce and what the return ratio is, uh, various sorts of uh, frame numbers uh, out frame and also that I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to roll the ball straight out of the frame. So this is an example of the kind of planning that you might end up with, which is easier to follow. Uh, I also have this one from an old project where we were observing a bee, and this was the sort of thing we saw the bee doing in the footage. 
And then I made lots of little notes on it about um, timing, what was happening per frame, slowing in and slowing out. I didn't do that here for the ball because there's a, a strict formula we follow for that, but with a B, it's a lot less obvious. And so I did that. We've got frames per second. Um, we've got a diagram of the wings, which is a, a sub animation that happens the entire flight pattern. Uh, and this ended up making a pretty decent animation in the end. So lots of different ways to plan your animation, but make sure that you do take the time to do it. Um, there's nothing more important because you're not going to be able to make accurate guesses when you get into the animation process. It's all going to get away from you. Here we have the bouncing ball rig in Maya that I'm going to provide to my students. And I may put a link to it directly in the description on YouTube. I haven't decided yet. Uh, but I have to make sure that my students are the only ones who have access to this for now. Uh, I'm going to show how to use this rig, and uh, then we're going to get into uh, setting up the animation and executing it. So you can see all these colorful lines around the geometry, and if you view a number of different animation rigs, these will become familiar. These are the control surfaces. Typically, we don't want the animator to mess around with the geometry, and we especially don't want them to start opening up all of the internal workings of the rig that would be very very bad and so we lock all of that stuff away um, usually in layers or we just lock them directly in their channels and then we provide control surfaces and that's for that it's so that when you drag over the entire thing you only end up selecting things that are appropriate to animate and you don't end up having the capability to break anything so i can't actually grab the geometry and i don't even recall i think there are bones in there and you can't grab the bones um, there are deformers, we can't edit those. We can only change what I intend for you to be able to change. First thing to look at is that over in the display layers, we've got a geometry layer for the tail that we can turn on and off, as well as for the controls, um, so that you don't have to deal with any of that. And in fact, for this animation, we can just leave that off. If you decide that you want to try to add overlap to the tail, that's fine, but don't do it at the cost to the ball animation. I want the ball animation to be executed first. Just because I'm showing off how the thing works though, very quickly I'll show all of these, they just rotate. And so if you rotate them, you rotate a part of the tail to pose it differently like this. And so you can make an animation effect out of that tail as if it's one big connected chain. I do recommend that if you're posing it more simply, just grab all of them at once and bend them together to get a nice smooth curve. Even if you wanted to have them twisting or bending to the side, you get much more attractive curves by grabbing them all at once. Then if you need to adjust the entire thing, you can move the base tail controller to get it into a better position or adjust one of these rings a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on how you want your pose to look. So that's what I recommend for that. And one of the benefits of having just these controls exposed is that if I grab them all like this, select my channels and type in zero, we can return them right back to their default orientation very quickly to start again with our posing. There's a problem in animation that can happen oftentimes called a gimbal lock, in which you rotate something past its bounds so that instead of having zero, where it appears to not be rotated, we have a 360, or it can just happen as a result of accidentally rotating two different channels uh, in a way that's not easy to, to spot. So we could do like this, and then this, and then we could get this thing around here and then we could bend this back and it looks normal but it's clearly not normal um, there are ways to solve that in the graph editor to fix that problem but it's better to try to not have it happen in the first place by bending these in a reasonable way according to the anatomy of the character anyway we don't have to deal with any of that for this animation so i'll just turn those layers off we can deal with these controllers this controller on the ground is just a placement object so it's not able to be animated. I've locked all of those layers so that you can't put keyframes on them. So essentially just push this into the scene where you'd like to begin, and then your animation graphs might make a little bit more sense. Uh, if we had a animation that was going at a diagonal to our grid for some reason, we could do this and then our animation object, if I set it to object, there we go, can move along one axis and make it very easy for us to edit in the graph editor. But if you don't do that, then this would be two axes and it would be hard to, you know, do our ease in and ease out for that. It's just a big mess. 
For that reason, I would always recommend try to primarily animate your object along a cardinal axis. So the X direction is facing left and right, or the Z direction is facing forward and back right now, and Y is up and down. It's a lot easier to deal with your animation graph if that's the case. So what I'm going to do here is just slide this over to negative 15, negative 13, something like that. I should probably type in the actual number so that it's uh, going to appear nicely on my graph. I estimated that the height of our animation was about 20 and the width was something more than that. So I'm going to do uh, negative 15. So we'll go from negative 15 to 15 and that'll give us a 30 range total to animate our object. Or you could just start it on zero and do the whole thing positive. It doesn't really matter. Uh, this one is our primary controller for placing the ball in space. So this is the one where we'll bounce it around our scene. Okay, So we're going to use the y-axis, we're going to use the x, and then in this very um, simple animation, we're not going to use the z-axis because we're just going to view it from the side as if it's two-dimensional. Okay, This, capable, this uh, object is capable of rotating in any direction, moving in any direction, and it's got a squash and stretch channel here which we can adjust the positioning for if we need to. And it's limited to what I consider to be a reasonable amount of squash and stretch. Uh, but that can be an extra channel that we can use for appearances in our animation later on. Uh, we've got this controller down here, this smaller ring, for the spin of the ball. Now you might be wondering, well, why would I spin it there when I can just rotate this? Well, the reason is because of that squash and stretch. If I stretch this ball, and I want it to be spinning, visually spinning, this one acts like a skin, whereas the other one acts like aim. Okay, We can actually aim the squash and stretch up here as well in case you want to do a sideways uh, squash and stretch and a vertical squash and stretch, or even have it moving around the ball. So I gave a lot of different flexibility and options for this, but don't get too confused by um, the number of options you can successfully execute this animation any number of ways, one of which would be just spinning this controller. But if you do that and you want the ball to appear to be rolling as it's bouncing in a different pattern, then it's gonna mess up the direction of the squash and stretch. So what I would suggest is leaving this controller basically straight up and down. We might lean it a little bit or use this controller to lean the squash and stretch and to do any ball spinning on this one. The ball that I picked in the reference was a green plastic one, which had no texture that was visible. But if you pick something like the blue bouncy ball or the softball, you can actually see the stitching rotating around as it's animating, and you might want that as a secondary behavior. I'm going to animate it as if we could see the roll in my example, but just know that that's not a hard requirement. Okay, So this one, mostly for positioning the ball in the scene, Okay, not necessarily for rotating. This one, mostly for spinning the ball itself, and if you're not going to animate that, then just don't touch it. This one is only for aiming the squash and stretch. So you could use this controller itself, or you could use that smaller little halo to aim the squash and stretch. If you are going to include squash and stretch, it's a good idea to include that one as well. So that's a little rundown of all of the different controls on our ball. Uh, for the next step, I'm going to show how to set up the scene for animation. When we're ready to start animating, we need to set up our scene for animation before we begin. And there are a couple of steps for that. Uh, you come down to this little running man icon, Animation Preferences. This can also be found in Windows Animation Editor, or sorry, Settings and Preferences Preferences. It's one of the tabs in here, but it'll take it to the correct tab. Um, so this little running man icon, and that opens up our Preferences menu on the Time Slider setting. You can see these are all the categories on the left hand side. There are a couple different categories that are relevant to us. This is the most important one. First, we want to set the frame rate to the frame rate we um, had our, our video reference at, or really what we just want to animate at in general. Uh, most of the time that's going to be 30 for my class uh, because that's appropriate for video games and for um, desktop computers. 24 is uh, the film standard. So if you were doing a feature film or something that might be on a more traditional projector, then that's what we would animate at. That's pretty old fashioned though, so we're just gonna set it to 30. Notice that that all adjusted when I hit that uh, because there are a couple of check marks here. Keep keys at current frames. 
we don't want to um, animate before we change that setting. So hopefully that won't be relevant, but it means that if you set a key when you are animating at 24 frames per second at 20, it'll still be at 20. Uh, I prefer to leave that checked on because if you don't do that, then it can turn into a fractional number like um, 21.75 or something like that. And that's a bad place to have a key number because you don't have any control over it. Uh, round time ranges to whole values. Yep, I always leave that one. I don't want my time range to be some fractional value. Um, playback start and end. You can actually change these right down here on the timeline by altering these numbers. And you can see the tooltip when I roll over them updates to say what they are. Uh, essentially, our playback start and end and our animation start and end, this is what you are viewing. And this is your entire file's worth of animation. So we want to leave the first one at one for now. But the last number in start end, I want it to be the last frame of my animation. So in my case, that would be 106. Or if I want to leave a little bit of blank time after the ball is exited frame, which is fine, I could set it to 120, which is a multiple of 30. And that way I have a whole number of seconds for my entire scene, with just about half a second or so of nothing happening after the ball has left so that our eyes can reset to the ball animating at the beginning. You could also set your playback start end to 120 as well to see the entire timeline. Or if you just drag this little square, then you can make uh, more or less visible on the timeline. I will initially set this 120 so we can see the entire animation all at once. I don't really think it's going to be an issue, but sometimes the um, little tick marks get very small and are hard to see. Uh, below that, we have playback, and this is a very important one. I believe the default typically had been play every frame as opposed to one of these other choices. The reason that's not appropriate is because play every frame will play as fast as it can every frame. So if you have a very simple scene, it will play at lightning speed. And if you have a very complex scene, it will play very slowly because it tries to process all the movements. Play at one times is real time. Okay, so leave that alone. Um, you might choose a different uh, option for looping. I just have continuous, which means it plays to the end, and then it resets itself and plays from the beginning again. Uh, oscillate would be a strange one. It would play forward, then backward. Once would play through and stop at the last frame. I just leave it on continuous. Loop play range when stepping frames and keys. I also like that because if I try to step forward a keyframe, and I'll give you the controls for that in a little bit, um, I want to pop all the way to the beginning again, which is something I prefer. Okay, so that's a good way to set up that one. Uh, if you go to settings, sorry, to animation, there's one more bit that I like to point out, which is that this auto key feature is visible down here as well. It's this little red um, arrows going around in a circle. I'll talk about what it means, but typically I leave it on. For beginners, I might recommend turning it off. Either way, there's a check mark here and it changes the little red button, which formerly was red down there. And then in the tangents section of animation, I always turn on weighted tangents, and then I just leave the defaults at auto for the moment. Okay. Um, the reason for this will only become clear once we're sufficiently into our animation to try to edit it in the graph editor. But non-weighted, I believe, is the default. Just change it to weighted and forget about it and just hit save. Okay. At that point, we're pretty much ready to start animating. The one other starting thing that we would maybe want to do, especially if we're using auto keying, is to set a keyframe on frame one for everything that we intend to move at some point in our scene. So like I described, we're never going to animate this, but we are going to animate this object a lot. You can just hit the S key, and that will put a keyframe on everything. So all of the movement channels, all of the rotate channels, and the squash and stretch channel. For a simple animation like that, we might not want to do that because it will clutter up the graph editor and make it harder to view the important information. But if we think about it for a second, we can figure out what we do want to animate. I want to animate squash and stretch. So I'm going to right click that and choose key selected instead. So there's only red on that. Um, am I going to want to animate the rotations of this object? In my case, no. I'm not going to touch any of them. I'll use this to affect the squash and stretch if I want to. Am I going to move this? Well, yes, but what direction? Up and down, E selected, and left and right, which is X. Okay, we can tell that by looking down here. If I don't key Z, 
then I never have to wonder, am I looking at the correct direction? That's just that way. I don't want to animate that. So now I've got three things animated instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. And so I'll only see that many graphs in the graph editor. It can be a bit of a bother to not hit S when you intend to, but by doing this right away and leaving auto key on, whenever I change a value in time, it'll record that value. So I actually don't have to hit anything. Do I want to animate this controller? Yes, only for spin. And as we can see, as I rotated that, another way to find out what's the correct channel is just move it and see which one of the numbers changes. In this case, it's rotate Z. So I'll hit key selected for that. Do I want to change this one? Yes. And again, I'm just going to want to aim it left and right. So I'm going to key rotate Z on that one. And that should be everything that I need to start my animation. So with that, I can use auto key. I can leave that on. I'll, for the first few frames, uh, set them manually to demonstrate what you would do if you want to turn auto key off. In fact, I'll turn auto key off for the first few and just do it manually. But I would strongly recommend uh, animating with auto key turned on so long as you're careful and you know what you're doing. Okay. So where do we begin? Well, we begin with our plan. Our plan says I need to lift this about 20 units into the air, have it 15 this way because we're going to do 30 total across our scene. Uh, and then I need to key its position. From there, I need to make sure it's moving steadily across the screen and that it's hitting the ground and rising into the air at all of these points. This is on my other screen, by the way, so it's not going to be visible in frame, but I, I have it nice and big where I can see it, and I'm going to refer to it the entire time. So with this primary selector, remember this one is just for positioning in the scene. With this primary selector, I'm on frame one. Always make sure you're on the correct frame first. Then I'm going to lift it 20 into the air. It's going to be pretty far up. I can just type in the number. And we can see that's how high my first bounce is going to be. And then without auto key on, this position is not saved right now. If I were to hit play or move in time, this would pop back down to zero because I didn't key selected yet. So there, see, popped right down to zero. So if we don't have auto key on, we have to go to the right frame number, enter in the right value, and then key selected, or if we're keying everything, hit the S key. Now, if I move, that ball will stay right there. Okay. We also have to think about, well, where are we starting horizontally in X? Well, we're starting at negative 15, or in this case, zero. Now, why does that say zero? Well, that's because I moved this controller negative 15. So it turns out in our graph editor, because this is a child, it thinks that we're at zero. So it's going to be very easy to understand how far it's gone. It's going to go this direction, right? Positive numbers until we hit 30, which is how far I wanted to go. Do we have this position on frame one recorded? Yes, we do, because I went through and keyed everything right away. But we can just do it to make sure. So now it's going to drop down to somewhere in front of us. I don't really know where yet. I'm just gonna kind of estimate. We can adjust this value. And then we're gonna drop back down to the ground. Where is the ground? Well, because of the way I set up this ball rig, it's at zero in Y, okay? Take a look and on the grid, zero makes contact with the grid. It might change when we include squash and stretch, right? Because it lifts off the ground or it pushes through the ground. But until we're adding that, we can just treat that as zero. Now, I can't do anything right now because I've actually made a mistake. I moved this forward, I moved it down, but I didn't move in time. And that's the important thing. Always move in time first, then change the position, then set the key, okay? So luckily I didn't hit S or I didn't hit key selected yet, so I can just move and we're back, right? That's the recorded position. So on my plan, it says that's frame 15. So I want to go to frame 15 on the timeline. You just left click and drag to move anywhere on the timeline. This is called scrubbing the timeline. And sometimes it's important to do to see a very complex action unfold. We're just going to go to frame 15. Then I'm going to grab my red controller, move this somewhere forward, just kind of a guess visually based on my chart, and then move it down to zero in Y. Okay. Now you can actually see the keys are all light pink to show that they are not currently keyed on this frame. 
but they have animation information. I'm going to grab both of those, key selected, and they turn red. Red says, I have a keyframe on this frame. You also get a little red line on the timeline to show you where you have keyframes available. So now if I play backward or play forward, I now have two keyframes that move the ball just from that top position to that bottom position. You can also step forward and backward keys by using the same keys that we were going frame by frame in YouTube. So that would be period and comma. That just jumps to the next command. And the only commands we've set are on frame one and frame 15. So we're just jumping between them right now. Okay, That can be helpful, but for now, not terribly important. All right, so the next thing, I have the choice to set all of these one by one. So I could set 24 or I could set 32. Now, why would I do that? Well, if I set 32, I can set the width first, and then I can go to 24, and my ball will probably already be somewhere in between because that's how keyframes work. They interpret between positions. So I just want to show you that you don't always have to set these in perfect order. So if I go to frame 32, if you have a good enough plan, that is, and I move this forward, like let's say here, okay? I only moved translate X, so I'm going to hit key selected, but 32 represents the next time my ball hits the ground. So I actually want to key translate Y as well at zero because I'm on the ground, okay? Now, if I back it up to 24, you see how it's moving between these two positions. There's 32, there's 15, okay? And so 24, we would expect to be right around here somewhere. Let's see. And look at that. It's pretty close, somewhere near at least. Okay. We could adjust this if we want to or not because it's already doing the right thing, but we do have to lift it up in the air. I'm going to suggest that you just place every position to start off with because it will give us an interesting um, thing that we can deal with in the graph editor after we're done. But I'm going to move it. I'm going to move it up in the air where I think is correct. I don't really know how high until I look at my plan. 20 units up, and we're supposed to go about a third of that, okay? So that's something like eight or seven, okay? So looking at my channel box over here, I can see seven point something is probably about right, and now I wanna key both those numbers. Notice I'm not keying squash and stretch at all because I don't yet know what I need to do with squash and stretch. A couple of the conventions of good animation practice, especially in 3D is, if you're going to set a command, try to set a command on as many things as possible on a certain frame. And we can call that a keyframe or an important frame storytelling wise, where everything is collected together and it just makes it easier to adjust things. It makes it easier to plan things. We don't want lots and lots of keys on lots of different frames because it will get very confusing. So you can see as I scrub the timeline, we start up high. There we go. Then we go hit the ground, but it sort of turns around softly will affect that stuff later in the graph editor. Then it comes up again, and then it comes down again. And for now, that's all we're doing. We're just setting the high and low positions throughout this entire animation. So just to do a couple more, I'm gonna go forward to 38, which is supposed to be up. And we're gonna to try to return it a third or maybe half this time. So we'll just set it about four. And then somewhere a little bit further forward, E both of those channels. I'll go ahead and turn auto keying on. Okay. I'm going to move in time, 43, my plan, grab my object, I'm going to move it forward, I'm going to move it down to zero. And now you'll see those channels turn red automatically. So both translate Y and translate X are red. And so I didn't have to key selected, it's already recorded. But if you don't put a key on everything, you might get an unpleasant surprise when something that you didn't intend moves. 48 is supposed to be about half of that, so we're going to move it up at about 2. Forward a bit, and it's already keyed. At 52, it hits the ground again. So time first, then position. And I just type in zero every time for the ground hits because that is precise enough that I know that it needs to be zero. Okay, here we go. Next one, 55. 
And you can see how quickly this passes once we have a good plan. We just have to enter in all these values. I have a number of different bounces. Let's see, I have one, two, three, four, five more bounces. So rather than diminishing by half every time, I'm going to make it a little bit more generous. So here we've got one point something, and I moved it forward a little bit at 55. Then we've got 58, which is on the ground. So I'm going to move it down to zero and move it forward a little bit. Now at this point, what you might notice is that it's a little tedious to keep entering in zero. And I'm at 50, sorry, which one am I at? 58, this one. And I've got one, two, three, four more, and a fifth one where it's just on the ground rolling out of frame. If I want, I can just put in all of those positions and then come back to the right frame and just lift the ball up every time. And that's an appropriate way to set keyframes as well. The only downside is at that point, I wouldn't have a key on X, but since it just needs to be in between this motion, this rolling or bouncing motion needs to be consistent, we're probably going to delete most of those keyframes anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and do this out of order. So I'm at 58 on the ground. So I'm going to find the next ground pose, which is 63. I'm going to move it forward a bit and then just key translate Y. So X was already keyed for me. Translate Y is on the ground. Okay. The next ground pose is 68. We're going to move it forward a little bit more and leave it at zero and key selected. Then we're going to go to 71, move it forward a little bit more. E selected 73, move it forward a little bit more, and key selected. And then the very last frame of my animation, 106, I have to end up at about 30. So that's about right. Let's push it a little bit further than 30, 32 or so. And I'm going to key select it on Y. This is where we should have our camera such that we don't see what happens after that. So we should put our camera somewhere around here. Let's see if we can see our ball at the start. No. Okay, so now we can. Now can we see our ball at the end? Unfortunately, we can. So adjusted something more like this. I may have to flatten up my view a little. So I could use my period and comma. There we go. So now we can see us at the start, but we can't see us at the end. So if I play this, it should roll out of frame. Okay, and We don't have all these little dribbles here yet because I haven't included them. Okay, I could also set an additional frame at 120 just further on to keep it rolling, but I don't really think that's necessary. This is where we're not going to see it anymore. Okay, So now we've got all the ground positions here. There's our last bounce that I actually keyed. So here between 58 and 63, I go look at my plan. 61 is a bounce. I'm going to lift that up a little bit. And now I could concentrate on how high I'm lifting it. I don't even have to set this key. Um, in fact, I think I won't. I'll just leave it. And I want to see how high was my previous bounce. 55 was at 1.1. This one I put at 0.3. I probably need to go at least 0.5 something. So now I've got three bounces left, 66. And so I'm going to go about 0.4 or 3, something like that. How about just 0.4? And it's auto keying it. Okay. Next bounce in the air is at, actually, I think I did that one wrong. I was supposed to be at 66. Oh, no, I did it right. Okay. Um, next one's at 70 right here. So this one I'll put like 2 point something or yeah about two it's fine and then the very last one is at 72 and this one should be tiny so about here and then it's zero so now it should dribble we watch that play point 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 and there it goes rolling okay so it looks like it loses the appropriate amount of steam as it bounces to a stop all right so that's our first whole keying session, and this would be a good time to save your file. A lot can go wrong in an animation, and you definitely need stages to refer back to. So I would strongly suggest saving your file. I have opened the rig file directly, all rig version. We're going to talk about how to reference rig files later on to protect the rig and make sure that we have a blank rig to refer to. 
in the moment, uh, at this moment where we're just doing this bouncing ball animation for the first time, go ahead and just open the rig file and save over it, but save it appropriately for your purposes. So give it a name. I like to name stages of animation when it's complicated, but you can just say animation one for this one, animation two, three, four. But this is our first big stage where all of our major keyframes are here. And now it would be a process of finding out how to clean up this motion and how to interpret it in the graph editor so that we get a more beautiful animation. But just so you don't think you've done anything wrong, if you follow this process, this is what the animation looks right, like right now, and it's not very impressive. That's completely fine. Just trust your planning, trust your measuring, and put in all the keyframes at the right time and at the right position. And remember the process, move on the timeline first, move the object second, and then if you don't have auto key, set key selected third. Time, position, key. Time, position, key. In that order. If something goes wrong, it's usually easier at this stage to start again and do your animation keys over than it would be to try to figure out what went wrong until you know where to look and especially how to use the graph editor. Okay. In the next step, we're going to be using uh, this as a starting point to adjust our keyframes and then also to interpret them in the graph editor for appropriate ease in and ease out and appropriate paths. All right, so now we're going to try to fix our animation up a little bit and get it all set looking the way it should before adding any kind of detail. And what that means right now is that this pathway that the ball is taking from the top to the bottom, that doesn't look good at all. It's doing this sort of underhand scooping motion. Why is it doing that? Uh, we didn't tell it to do that, but of course we didn't tell it to do anything. We just set a frame at frame one and a frame at frame 15. We didn't say, I want you to arc overhand like this. There's a way to do that sort of thing, and it involves the graph editor. So to open the graph editor, we go to Windows, Animation Editors, Graph Editor, and we get this window. Now, for the purposes of recording, it's a little bit difficult for me to juggle two windows together, but I'm going to do my best. I think that I'll just undock this so that I can have them floating side by side and go back and forth. I'm also going to hide the outliner because we don't really need to look at that. So hopefully this will be appropriate enough to look. You're going to see that we don't have anything visible in the graph editor, and it's because it will only show you what you select and things that have keys on them. So when I grab this controller, which is the only one we've been using so far, not only do we see our keyframes on the timeline, but now we see all this information on the graph editor, and it's the same information, basically. Okay. On the left-hand side, we've got a list, and this list will show all of the different things that have keyframes or keyable information on them. So we've got translate X, and now it will show us only that one. Translate Y, this one looks a little bit more familiar, bouncing up and down. Scale X, the reason this is showing is because of the under the hood rigging that I've done in uh, the ball rig. So try to it, just ignore that one. In fact, I think that there's a way to not show that stuff, but I don't quite remember. Probably somewhere in here where we can say, I want to show these kinds of things, but not those kinds of things. I'll have to figure that out at some point. Uh, but for now, just ignore that. Scale Z, same thing, just ignore that. We do have squash and stretch down here, though, and that is our channel that we will key later on. We'll see our animation pop up in there. Okay. So for now, these two are the really appropriate ones. So we can see the red line is how far across the stage it's progressing. The green line is how high up and down it's bouncing. We foresaw that we could drag along the timeline to scrub our animation. Now you can see that yellow playhead in the graph editor is doing the same thing. In fact, if we grab that and drag it, we can see our animation play while we see what frame we're at. And all of those little dots, those are our keyframes. That's the information that we set, okay? So to make this a little bit easier um, to start off with, let's just focus on translate Y, one channel of animation. This is just up and down. So here, we can see 20, this represents the value for that keyframe. Okay, we are at 20 units in the air. And then as we move down, we hit zero on this keyframe. In fact, if I select it, you can see the values right here. This is the frame number. This is the value number. 
if you want to edit them directly in here. So we've hit the ground and then we rise back up and we fall back down. We rise back up, fall back down over and over and over again. So that's what our animation looks like. Sometimes the way that we're viewing this is a little bit squished. There are some hotkeys to change the view. Um, if you hold down both shift and alt and then hold down right mouse button, you can drag horizontally to stretch or squish the view. So that is shift and alt. And if you drag vertically, we can scale the view. And the controls for the two dimensional editors in Maya are very similar to the three dimensional. Do alt middle mouse button to pan your screen, and alt right mouse button to zoom your screen. So it takes a little bit of getting used to the fact that you can do this in a 2D editor. But here I've got my um, values taking up most of the vertical space and also most of the horizontal space too, because I want to be able to see nice and big what we're referring to. Sometimes you'll look in here and it will look like that, even though the values are rather big and it can be kind of confusing. Uh, another helpful key can be if you don't have anything selected, so that would be selecting a keyframe. You can just hit the F key for focus, just like you do in the 3D view, and it will attempt to frame your animation in an appropriate way. We have a long roll here, so I'm just going to stretch it out horizontally so that I can see the bounce section instead. So hitting F for frame can be a helpful thing and using your camera controls the same way that you do in 3D. So what do we do? Well, I was complaining initially about how it doesn't arc down to the ground. It does this sort of scooping action. And so now if I just take a look and focus on this section, we can kind of see why that's happening. The default for setting animation information is that it sort of ease out of everything and ease into everything. So it tries to sort of buffer all of the movements to where they become this oscillating wave, which is very, very soft. That could be fine, but it tends to lack personality and make everything seem to float effortlessly from place to place. And that doesn't give any sort of feeling of being a real object or having any kind of personality. Okay, so those are the default tangents. We have some other tangents that we can alter up here. In fact, now it looks like they've swapped out the auto tangents for both the auto in and auto out tangent, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but if I select this here, we can see this one's the one currently being used. It is the auto tangents. I thought a tool tip would pop up over my mouse, but it's actually all the way down here at the bottom, unfortunately. So I'm gonna scoot the interface up, mouse over, See, select and mouse over, there it goes, auto tangents. And that's what we see here. All these are just kind of gently bouncing waves. I'm gonna select all of them for a moment just to show you the difference between all of these presets, but we can set them per keyframe. Um, this one is called spline tangents. So they're sort of like the auto, only they don't care if you are at the first frame or last frame, they'll allow you to just head in that same direction. And they also sort of lean left and right. So they're a little bit better than auto, not by much. These ones are clamped, clamp tangents. Wow, they didn't really do very much. Clamp tangents are, are supposed to try to respect the fact that they've hit an extreme and be flat in that position if you have approached an extreme, but it doesn't look like it's really doing it right now. Linear tangents are really easy to understand. They just go directly from one position to another. And if you intuitively think about what should happen, this is probably your idea of what should happen when you set keyframes with nothing else involved. It just goes directly from one position to another without any consideration for speed or cushioning. Okay, And it looks really ugly and robotic, but it's also very easy to imagine and easy to deal with. Uh, flat tangents. So flat tangents means every single one of them would be flat no matter what. It looks the same as auto when we view it like this, but if I show you what it looks like on the X values, you see it just flattens everything. So it's actually pretty inappropriate for this one, although it's pretty good for, for this particular set. Um, then we've got stepped tangents. So stepped tangents are an interesting one, sort of a concession to traditional animation in that it will hold the position that you said right up until the moment that it gets a order to the contrary. So this is holding a value at 20, right up until the moment that I said be at zero. And when we play this back, it looks like rapidly teleporting. Or sorry, it's sliding along an X because I'm only dealing with Y. 
but if I did it for X as well, then it would just hold position entirely. So you see it sort of teleports from position to position. Sometimes, especially with character animation, it can be nice to have step tangents because it gives you, uh-oh, oh, I docked it by mistake, sorry. Uh, it can give you a really strong uh, impression of what your poses are, what the poses you've set without Maya interpreting anything. For this, it's just gonna be distracting, so we're not gonna use that. And then finally, we have plateau tangents. Plateau is similar to clamped. Um, the differences are pretty, pretty minor. Um, you kind of have to see it to understand. But again, this tries to respect the fact that it's a maximum or minimum value um, by flattening those values out, but otherwise doesn't pay any attention if it's an intermediate value. So I think if I, if I use plateau tangents on this, yeah, they basically stay exactly the same. Clamp stays the same too, though. I'm not in entirely sure the difference between these sometimes, but there is one. I just can't put it into words at the moment. So what do we do here? Well, when we observed our bouncing ball and thought about what are the forces acting on it, we found that the tops are all rounded and the bottoms are all sharp because they change direction suddenly. So we can use that information to do this. We're going to say the tops of these need to be flat. Okay, so we're going to grab all the tops. If I can grab them all, say flat tangents. Oh yeah, I did actually get them all. And then the bottom keyframes, the one that hit the ground, those need to be like linear. There we go. So that looks a lot better. And they do get very small down here. So I'll zoom in, zoom in, get closer, grab those, set them to linear. So now we've got these sharper sort of molehill looking graph lines. And let's see how that plays. That's actually a lot better. Okay, so we've got a nice sharp turnaround at the bottom each time. We've got a nice soft reversal at the top each time. It's not super great, but it's way better than it was. So let's see if there's something else we can do. Well, look at these arcs. They don't exactly look like what I've drawn here or what I've observed. They're not an arc that goes completely vertical almost by the end. They're an arc that takes on an angle and then just holds that angle to the end, okay? And that's because of something we call the tangent handles, okay? So far, we've only messed with uh, an entire key. By the way, left-clicking and selecting a key allows you to then move it if you want to. I'm not going over that just yet, but we will in a moment, okay? Um, so far, we haven't really edited anything except for the tangents up here. So at the top, we have these flat tangents, and the tangent handles are lined up flat. At the bottom, we have linear tangents, and what they do is they aim the tangent handle at the neighboring key. So you can see it's aiming it right there. But it would be nice to be able to move these, and in fact, we can. If you select a tangent handle, you can middle mouse drag to change its position a bit. There's a problem, though, in that both of them move at the same time. By the way, if you're trying to do that and it didn't work, um, hit your transform key, W, then select the key, then select the handle, then hold down middle mouse and move. Okay. Sometimes you need to um, hit your selection key, your transform key again. Um, so right now that's not ideal. I want to be able to move both of them vertical. And in fact, it lets me scale them as well because I have weighted tangents turned on. So this is not exactly helping. Uh, there's another button up here, a couple of them actually, right here. This is unifying tangents, okay, unify tangents. And this is break tangents. So right now, all the tangents in our entire graph are unified. As in, if I select one and then select one of the handles, the other one will try to mimic what its neighbor is doing. Okay, And that can be fine. In fact, it is fine for the tops of these graphs, but it's not fine for the bottom. We need to break them. Okay, It's a setting. You can just go back and forth and turn it on or off. So I'm going to break these tangent handles. They become dashed lines. Select one. And I'm going to move it towards vertical. And now look what happens. It starts to arc a bit more. I'm going to do the same thing here. And I'll go ahead and do it just for the first couple to show the difference. Like this and like this. So it's more semicircular. Now we could make this even better by grabbing the top tangent handle and maybe sliding it out a little bit. But we run the risk that we accidentally tell it to go up a little bit or down. And so another thing you can do is hold down shift before you do that 
and it will just lock you to the direction you drag in. So now it's only horizontal. I know a lot of this seems like super tight controlling and maybe too much care, but animation is a lot more like architecture than sculpture in that you have to plan a lot. You have to have an idea in your head before you attempt it and you have to execute it with quite a bit of accuracy sometimes. Okay, so keep that in mind. This is a, a pretty pedantic, pretty careful kind of artistic uh, discipline. And so this is not something that you can effectively ignore and have a lot of success in 3D, okay? So here I've stretched out these tangent handles on the top by holding down shift to just scale them. And you see, we get really strange things happening when they go too far, just to create a round lump shape, okay? And these ones on the bottom, we broke the tangent handles to orient them upward. Now let's see this playback and it's gonna be a lot different. Look at that. It's a very nice snappy bounce on those first couple of balls. Okay, so that's an example of polishing our keyframes into a pathway and a spacing that's much more appropriate for what we're trying to do. We're still only dealing with vertical, right? We're still only dealing with Y. We haven't touched X at all, but we can already see a world of difference in the way that this has got a nice jumpy, snappy kind of personality to it. You can go too far. Okay, so let's, let's go too far. Let's see what that looks like. I'm going to grab this one and stretch it out to where it's very, very close to vertical. We'll do the same thing for this. And we'll try to make it as round as possible. But now it's sort of like a tooth or like a, a slice of bread or something. It's round, but it's rather flat at the top. What's going to happen is even more extreme animation spacing. So it stays very, very close to the top and then rapidly slams into the ground and pops back again. This can be great for cartoony animation, but right now we're just observing from life and this is too much. You can see how much space it covers in those last few moments. And if we were to look back at our animation reference, our video, we would see that it doesn't do something like that. Okay, that would be more like a paddle ball being violently smacked against the paddle. Um, instead, we want something a little bit more subtle than that. In fact, if we go even more extreme as we were seeing just a little bit ago, we get problems like this, where this is trying to go that way, that is trying to go upward. And so we get this big rapid reversal and that's actually a problem. Okay. So on that second bounce, I think I have to drag here. There we go. See that? That's what's happening in that glitching zone where the two tangent handles are fighting each other. Okay. So we definitely don't want something like that to occur. Instead, we're going to make sure that this is still nice and round. Okay, this first one's not too bad, but I am going to reduce it a little bit and bring these handles a bit away from vertical just to make them a little less crazy. And also don't stretch them up too far. That can cause a problem as well. Just something that creates a nice visual, something like that. And so let's go ahead and finish out the rest of these. Once you get down to the ones that have like single frames between each other, there's no point in messing with the tangent handles anymore unless we're going to scale your animation somehow. Let's just make sure that these are all flat. These are all linear. They are. These bottom ones are all broken so that we can face them upright more. And this is to just make sure each bounce actually looks like a bounce. Just take a second. So at about this point, I don't really have a reason to edit these, so we'll just leave those be. And if any of these arcs looks a little bit too sharp on the top, I'm also going to scale it to be a bit more round. In fact, this one, there we go, just a little bit more. If I broke the tangent handles up here as well, then I could scale one side and not the other. But in this case, I think this is just a little bit too high, and I want to scale this to get it round on both sides. Okay. So this one, and then we're probably done. Okay. The rest of those don't really matter. Cool. There's also another thing that we can use the graph editor for, but let's play that first. Okay. Great. Okay. You may have noticed by now that some of your bounces are at inappropriate heights, or you'd like to adjust them. And it's a little hard to adjust them in the 3D view because 
You have to find the right frame, then remember where the other position was. And am I supposed to go a little higher, a little lower? Well, in the graph editor, we can see all of those values side by side. So it's easy to adjust things. We have to be a little bit careful about how we adjust things because we can mess up our animation timing. But again, holding shift is the answer there. Here's our first position. Here's our second position. I want to get about a third. Yeah, that's about right, but it doesn't really maintain throughout. If I zoom in, squeeze these in just a little bit. That one's about half. Yeah, it's appropriate. This one's about half. And then maybe I want to adjust these. Maybe I want to do a slightly better job. Okay. So let me do this. I'm going to raise this first bounce just a bit. Leave that one alone. And I'm going to lower this one just a little bit. And then this one, I'm definitely going to lower. This one, I'm going to lower just a bit. This one, I'm going to lower. And at this point, I need to scale my graph. There we go. I can see more clearly now to about halfway, halfway, and about halfway. Now, I zoomed in a lot. Don't be fooled and think that you suddenly have to adjust these lines. I'm just looking at things in very, very small size. The frames up here right, are still whole frame numbers, but the values are down to fractional values. When we zoom way back out again, it's not going to look like I changed very much, but motion is a sensitive thing. A lot of people can sense the difference between very, very delicate motions. So now at least vertically, that bounce is observing a ratio that I think is uh, appropriate and also rather nice on an aesthetic level. Right, kind of nice, slow, diminishing. It almost falls a curve. Okay, this is down to how picky you are and what sort of personality you want to impart. But I just wanted to point out that you can adjust values directly in the graph editor. Now, be careful when you grab a value. We are middle mouse dragging from that point, but I can move it anywhere, and that's the problem. Okay, this is changing the value of that position. This is changing the timing that position. So I'm moving it from the frame that it was on, 24, to a different frame, 22. And in fact, it lets you move to subframes like, oh no, sorry, that's 23. I was wrong. I thought it was letting me go like 22 and a half or something. That would be terrible. Um, so if you want to make sure that you are just changing the value, again, hold down shift. And that way, it's just going to be the value on Y. Uh, we can actually see these things change directly in the 3D view if I'm altering it. And if you look down on the timeline, just keep your eye on the red dash. When I let go, you can see a new red dash. The old one is because we had a value in X over here, but now we've got a key over here on, uh, what is that, 22. So I'm going to undo that and just leave it on the same key value. Okay. So just be aware that you can change those things. You probably want to avoid changing the timing in here unless you're doing it intentionally. What about the X value though? Uh, we haven't messed with that yet. So I'm gonna ho hop over there, hit F to frame it. And we can see that it's kind of a vague meandering line. And that's because we made a lot of guesses about the spacing uh, horizontally. When I drew this, I can kind of use, you know, my ability to, you know, eyeball things to make an appropriate amount of spacing here, sort of. But in 3D, that's a lot harder. And we can see that they're just kind of jittering up and down. There's no real rhyme or reason to it. The two important positions are our starting position and our end rolling position. Maybe this one where it ends the dribbling is important too. Okay. The rest of these were just guesses. And frankly, we don't need them. If we delete them, this is what we get, our default in-out tangents. And if I play this back right now, let's see what we get. It's rolling to a stop now. It's also accelerating from this position. So it's actually ruined our first arc or two. Okay. But by now, you might know how to fix that. Our in tangent, right? Instead of being default, it needs to be linear. Okay. We just need to let it be in motion right from the very start. Now, what we're seeing is a constant motion, right? A nice smooth motion across, and then it starts slowing down only at the very end. Well, remember, we wanted to roll out of frame. So this one could be linear too. Now, the only thing that's making it anything less than a completely straight line is this one. 
do we want to see it slow down a little bit at the end or not? Um, I think so, sure. So I will just angle this a little tiny bit. And for this linear one, I'm going to break its tangent and just aim it a little bit higher like this. So I've got a little tiny slowdown, and why not? At the start, I'll just arc it overhand a little bit. And in fact, let's slide this just a bit. So I'm trying to get a subtle, not too obvious overhand arc. I think maybe this last one I just need to, there we go, something like that. So that should mean that mostly this ball is traveling smoothly across the screen, but it is very slightly slowing down, never actually coming to a stop. You might wonder what this red line beyond our last keyframe is. That's the infinity. Um, the infinity is the um, positions that it will go into after you've stopped giving commands. There are a lot of settings for infinities, like we can loop them or we can oscillate them or we can hold them in a linear position. For right now though, let's just ignore it. It's not really important unless we start doing cycle animation. So let's see how this plays now. I've edited the Y position, I've edited the X position, and now it's got a very, very smooth, very under control bounce pattern. We're still kind of lacking in personality, but we've at least got something fairly accurate to what we observed on video. And now would be the time to adjust anything like we aren't moving far enough sideways, okay? If you think that when you watch it, we're not going far enough to the side, we could adjust that right now easily by changing these values. We can scale things in the graph editor as well. I've zoomed way out so that I can grab all three things. And I'm going to hit my scale key, okay, just like you would in 3D. You can see it just selected. When I hold down middle mouse, it will scale these keys apart in position. And it, we can do it in time, which I definitely don't recommend, or in value, which sometimes can be appropriate. But I want you to see that wherever my mouse starts from is where it scales to and from. So that's helpful because I don't want this to start somewhere different. I want it to start in zero. I just want it to maybe go farther or not go as far. So I'm going to line my mouse up on zero, hold down the middle mouse button, and definitely you can hold down shift as well for this one. And if I drag vertically, now it's going to travel twice as far, going to 60. But all of those tangents stayed the same. So I didn't mess up my animation. So let's see, what does this do? I'm going to have to zoom out, I think. Look at that. We're going so much further, and it's rounded out the shape of those bounces quite a lot. It's as if I gave it an extra push. Okay, Or we can do the opposite. We can scale, holding down Shift and Middle Mouse, all the way down to 10. Those tangents are still holding their shape. If I hit F, it still looks exactly the same. So that means I'll have a slight, subtle slowdown, but it'll only travel 10 units. So the animation is still basically appropriate. So this can be a really powerful way to edit your animation sometimes. Better to have good planning and try to pick good values when you start, but you're not in trouble if you find that something isn't quite what you want it to be, you can adjust it. So I'm going to adjust it back to, if not 30, then now yeah, let's just make it somewhere around 30. Uh, we could figure out if that is 30 exactly, by the way, by selecting and reading these numbers. But there's no need for this value to hit that exact number in this case. It would just be something if you had a very special reason to make it arrive perfectly. So now traveling 30 units, we can play this and see. It just gets off the grid. Okay, We can do the same thing with Y, but there's a lot more going on in Y. And so it could be a lot scarier to do. And if we do it wrong, we're going to mess up something like where the ground is. So here I've grabbed all of my animation. I know it's tempting to scale it in this direction. Sorry, get my scale key in this direction, but that's time, right? I know that you may want to speed things up and slow them down by scaling in time. There are a lot of reasons why that's a bad idea. Fractional keyframe numbers is one of them. Uh, another is trying to coordinate it with all of your other channels. I just strongly recommend that you not do it for now, um, but you can play around with it on your own um, when there's low risk to see why I'm, I'm saying that. If we wanted to scale the Y values though, 
we would create taller bounces or shorter bounces, especially if we did it from the ground. So here, I'm going to just make shorter bounces. All my bounces will take place between six units. So we play that. So now it's making a huge amount of horizontal progress and very little vertical. So if I come back to Translate X, I guess it doesn't really matter where it starts from. I'm going to undo it anyway. But now it's starting at 10 frames and ending at 20. Um, so it's only making 10 frames of progress. So now our animation takes place in a very, very small space, which makes the characters of the ball look completely different. That's the problem. We're not doing this with a strong purpose. We're just doing it because we can. And so have caution before you do something like this. Let's frame that. Okay. But if you observed, if you looked at your animation and thought, oh, no, I didn't lift the ball high enough to start off with or I lifted it too high to start off with and it doesn't look like the video, now's the time that you could fix it. I actually think this looks pretty near to what I saw in the video. I could even make it a little higher than this and it would be like I saw in the video because of the size of that ball. But this is a way to change those things fundamentally. All right, so now you know how to view things in the graph editor, how to frame them appropriately, and scale the view by holding Shift, Alt, and right click, or Alt, middle mouse. Okay. You can select individual keys and view their values. You can change their default tangents, break the handles, unify the handles, select the handles, and move or scale them. I've actually still got the scale tool on, so I'm glad that happened. I have to hit W, and now I can move the tangent handle around again. Uh, if you mess up your tangent handle somehow, let's just say for the sake of argument, we break these because we wanted to scale a little bit, but then it gets like a little torpedo shape and we go, oh no, I've made a big mistake. Just reunify them and set them to flat and start there. Okay, so now we can scale again, hold shift. We can scale again to get them back. And then if I wanted to break them and just scale a little bit more holding shift, I can make this side a little bit lumpier if I really wanted to. So if you end up messing them up, just reunify and use one of the defaults and you should be back to a workable state. Okay, so there we go. And you can scale your animation keys, uh, but be cautious. Try to only do it in value. Uh, in the next section then, I'm going to show how to add a little bit more personality to this bouncing ball by utilizing both the spin on the ball, which we haven't touched at all, and squash and stretch as well as aiming to create a more finalized look. All right, in our last video, we edited all of the major features of our bouncing ball to appropriately display. And so we've got nice bounces, we've got a nice roll across the scene, and it plays decently, but we don't have those little touches of personality such as squash and stretch. And right now our ball is also ice skating rather than rolling. So I'm gonna show you how to, one, add some roll that maybe wasn't even observable in the original video, and two, how to use the squash and stretch to make it look like it has a little bit more personality. So first for the rolling, for rolling, we want to use this small yellow controller. And that's all we're going to do is rotate it around in this direction. Because rolling is only associated with the horizontal movement of that ball, this one, okay, we sort of need a graph that looks basically exactly like this one. We need a keyframe at the start. We could put a keyframe here to make sure that it doesn't slide or slip, but we really only need the keyframe at the end. Uh, I'm going to show you a feature of the graph editor, which is really nice in that these little pins can help you to keep displaying certain channels, even once you've selected something different. So I'm going to just pin translate X and you can see it's still there. Now, when I grab the other controller, here we go, then I can pin, what's the channel that I need here? Rotate Z. There it is. Okay. So I can pin rotate Z. Now I don't actually need anything selected at all to be able to set keyframes on and edit these things. And I can see both of them at the same time if I want to. Okay, So I'm going to grab both of them and hit F. But right now, Rotate Z has no key values. Okay, 
So we have to set a starting position and an ending position. Um, you could set your start position on Z. In fact, we do have that one at least, but I think it looks a little artificial to start the ball rotating freely where it's perfectly lined up like that. So I'm just gonna tilt it back at some angle kind of like that to start off with. I do have auto keying still on. So now this 33 degrees where it's starting, it's that's fine for my starting position. Then I want to take a look at the translate X and I want to go to this last frame number. Uh, we could use our keyboard key, uh, shortcut uh, period and comma to jump to that last keyframe. So here we've got one. Oh, but I need it selected to do that. There we go. So we could jump to that last keyframe. Jump, 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 jump. There we go. So that frame is 106. And we do want the value on our other controller to be on that same time, 106. So here at 106, I am going to just rotate this around and around and around a few times to create a rather large value. It ends up being a negative value. That's okay. It's going in the correct direction. And we can either key that right now or with auto keying, it's already set. Do I know if that amount of rotation is correct? Absolutely not. No, I don't know that. So we have to watch it play and we have to see if it feels appropriate. For one thing, you can see that it's slowing down at the end and it's speeding up at the beginning. So that was not something that was desirable. And also I didn't anticipate that. So let's go ahead and frame that. Okay, so here it is. And here's the other value that we were talking about. You can see compared to one another, the X value is very flat because it changes value very little. And the Z value changes a lot because it has to go round and round and round. So seeing them side by side, sometimes not possible in that way. But I know that I want both of these to be linear tangents. So now we'll have a consistent rotation for our ball. Let's see if that feels any better. Okay, it feels better and it looks somewhat appropriate, but we also know that we want our rotation value to slow down just a little bit at the end. So if I view this line and I did flatten it out just a little bit because it was coming to too much of a stop, we have just a very slight arc in the line. So in this one, I want just a very slight arc in the line. I'm going to break the tangents so I can just affect this one. And here it's a little bit confusing. Our line is going down. Our other line was going up. Which direction should I drag this handle? Should I drag it up or down? Okay. Well, what you want to think about is how do you approach a stop? You know, what is a stop in this graph? A stop is horizontal. So since we're approaching this direction and horizontal here would be a stop, we should drag this down a little bit because this is closer to coming to a complete stop. This would be a complete stop. That's what happens when we set the default tangents. Um, this would be going faster and faster. See how the line gets more vertical rather than more flat? We want it to get more flat. So a very slight underhand curve is what we want. And I'm going to break this one as well, just so I can affect only that one. And that should be more than enough, just a slight underhand curve. Let's see if we can sense that that is slowing down slightly. A little bit, sure. Okay. Then as far as that rotation is concerned, that's pretty much it. Only I'd like to come in really tight here and take a look at it as it rolls by or it bounces by to see if it's in sync with the grid or not. So there we've got this hula hoop shape kind of helping us out and we can see the grid lines. We can sort of see, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I kind of see a little bit of sliding on the ball in that it's not rotating quite as fast as it's moving. And it's really hard to spot, let's see. Yeah, so just looking at this yellow band, it's getting closer to this grid point than I think it should. Okay. So since it's sliding a little bit, it's not rotating quite as much as it should. Well, all that means is that we want to take this line and we want to scale it a little bit larger. Okay, so I'm going to start my uh, mouse up here near the top, holding down shift and middle mouse. Oops. Let me undo to make sure that I only go larger just a little bit larger like that. How much larger? I don't know. I have to watch what happens. There we go. So now it looks like this yellow is hitting this point and kind of staying there as it rolls past. I don't want to change the tangents at all. 
It just means that it's rotating a tiny bit faster than it was before because I've got that start and end position. And that looks basically appropriate. Okay, This is sort of an estimate but you would know that it was obviously wrong if I set this line to be far too shallow. So let's scale it all the way down to like here. So now it's not nearly rotating as much. Watch it play back. See if you can see the difference. You kind of see that? It's sort of floating across the surface. And if I scrub it, watch one of the yellow lines. They stay in the same place towards the ground oriented quite a long time. They don't really move along with those grid lines, okay? So that's what you get if it's far too little, far too much, and it would be sort of peeling out like a car tire, um, you know, squealing from a start. We don't want that either, okay? So this one's sort of a matter of taste. Try to get it right. Uh, if you don't get it quite right, it's very likely nobody's gonna notice except for maybe me if I'm scrutinizing it, uh, but just try to get a fairly appropriate amount now let's talk about squash and stretch, which is a little bit of the more complicated one. Squash and stretch is an effect. It's not really something that's happening um, to most of those balls that you can observe on video, except for the medicine ball, where you definitely can see it. Um, you'll think that you're seeing it with a bouncy ball, like the small rubber one, but that's really only because it's sort of stretching because you're seeing a blur in the, in the camera. So squash and stretch has to align with the motion. So as it's coming down this direction, it has to lean to the left because it's pointing back where it came from and towards where it's going. And on the other side, it has to lean right. When it hits the ground, if you're going to squash it at all, it has to be perfectly vertical, squishing down into the ground. So all of that orientation stuff means that we have to do a few somewhat complicated, maybe uncomfortable things as we're doing the squash and stretch. First of all, let's bring our time to a hit on the ground. Here's frame 15. This is the best time to squish the ball into the ground because it's the most violent landing we've got. If we're going to squish the ball at all on the impacts, this is the time to do it. So I'm going to only squish it at about negative two. It's going to be visual uh, or maybe felt uh, when we play the animation, but you really won't be able to see a large distortion. This does cause one effect in that we've got to lower the position just a bit so it will continue hitting the ground. I think, I think that's it. Bring it up just a tiny bit, right there. Okay. Um, I had already keyed squash and stretch at the first frame. So now I have this recorded, but if you don't have auto key on, be sure to key selected in that position. Now here's the thing. Watch this as it goes back up. It's still squished. And it's returning back to circular. Well, that's wrong. Okay, it should be stretching during this fall, not squashing. Okay, not squashing so slowly. So the frame right before an impact, okay, is when it's traveling its fastest. This is when it needs to be doing the opposite thing. And it's doing the opposite thing about as strongly as the squash is. So negative two, this can be about negative two. I, Try not to go too far with it because it ends up looking very silly very quickly. But I'm going to go ahead and just entertain the thought that it should be about negative 2 or positive 2, whatever it is. So there we go. Now it's oriented straight up and down. And if we take a look at that. So now it's stretching out during the entire fall. This almost poses another issue in that you're probably not going to see any stretch by this point in the animation. You're only going to start to see stretch pretty late in the game, about halfway down through the fall. So we may want to clamp this at zero at this position, let it stretch in the last few frames, and then squash when it impacts. And then we need to do the opposite on the next one. Okay. The very last thing we want to consider is that it's not oriented in the direction of travel. And that's where the small little halo just needs to be angled backward. Ooh, that scared me for a second. The squash deactivated momentarily and then reactivated. Um, then down here, oh no, that's still oriented back here. This needs to be zero. Okay, so keyed at zero here, leaned back, and then we don't really care what it does before then, but if you want to be very, very 
careful. You could also lean it more extremely back so that it follows the direction of travel the entire time with the stretch, but we're not having any stretch up there, so it doesn't really make any sense. Okay, So there's one fall. Um, I won't play this yet until we get at least a couple of them because it's a very subtle effect, but let me demonstrate doing the second one. Okay, so if we go to midair, you may want to just pop there. There we go. So here's midair. We definitely don't want any squash and stretch when we're in midair, and we definitely don't want this leaning any direction. So I'm going to just key select it. Okay, going backwards towards this leap. Here's the squash. Here's the stretch. This is going upward very quickly. So now we want to have it stretching out. And again, it's about as much as the squash was in the first place. Okay. We also want this leaning in the direction of travel. Okay. All of those things keyed, we can track forward. And then this is why I say, if you want to be careful, just aim this way over here. Okay. You can see, since I set that value, we want to pick where's our position. In fact, let me undo. Where's our position where we're going to stop seeing any squash and stretch at all? Let's just pick 20. At this point, I'll lean it forward and I'll turn it to zero. So we have every guarantee that it was always aiming in the correct direction during its ascent. Now it's zero. It doesn't matter where it is. So it's resetting itself back to middle. And then we can do the same thing falling down. Okay. So there's one whole bounce there. Let's do the next one. And after one or two of these, you're going to pretty much stop doing any squash and stretch unless you have a very, very squishy ball. So here at the bottom, again, we're going to squish. Not as much as last time. Same thing as diminishing bounces. We don't want this one to squish more because it's got less force. We do want to lower it a little bit to the ground. I've got auto keying on, so that's going to be fine. We want to make sure that it's centered. I'm going to key this. Okay. Previous frame. It needs to be angled in the direction of travel and stretching, but not quite as much as before. Just like that. Keyed, keyed. Okay. And coming out of the bounce, we want to make sure it's angled in the direction of travel and that it's stretching, but not quite as much as before. So you see, it starts to be very, very subtle. And then we want to make sure that we're not seeing a stretch for the entire ball. We want it to start maybe about here. So at this point, I grab my handle, zero it, and key it. And make sure that this, where it's zero, is just angled in the correct direction of travel. Good. Okay. Going back up to our next apex. Here we are. I'm going to check where do we want to stop seeing our stretch. Pretty quickly, actually. Right about here. So here, zero. And our handle, I'll just lean it there. It can be a little bit confusing with all of these different uh, controllers visible over the ball. And so I'm going to play it with those controllers. And then I'm going to turn those controllers off so you can see it without. Okay, and let's reduce our playback range a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to just say show nerves curves. So now we should only see the geometry. It's subtle. And if you do it with the wrong kind of timing, it can end up making it look like a football tumbling end over end. So have some care. Don't exaggerate this too much. If we go frame by frame scrubbing back through, see it kind of looks like a football flopping there which is unfortunate because of how the lines are lined up. And so honestly, it might have hurt the animation to do that squash, squash and stretch. We might want to remove it entirely because of that. Or, as I saw in the video, maybe just not have a squish. We could have a stretch, but no squash. That's an option. You can choose to do that. Um, do whatever you think is best, but I think in my case, I'm going to give it no squash and just leave the stretch alone. I'm going to place these back up on the ground. Okay. And I'm going to zero this out. Place it back up on the ground. 
And so the stretch should be unaffected. There we go. But my squash doesn't exist anymore. So the force of the impact doesn't appear to do anything visual. And probably we don't need very much squash or stretch by the time we get over to this third bounce. We might add just a little bit if we think so, but maybe not. Okay, and let's watch that and see if that helped in any way. I actually do think it helped. Yeah. I like that better. So it might not be the same case for you. You might want both squash and stretch, or you might want just stretch, no squash, kind of up to you. But in my case, I think that gave it better personality. In fact, I almost like this being the total duration of my animation now at about 70 before the, the dribbles have even stopped because it frames it so nicely. I'm going to zoom out just a bit more. I'm trying to find a nice appropriate framing right about there, I think. Yeah. And then I'll let it play a bit longer. About 90. 90 is an even three seconds. Yeah, actually, I think about three seconds where it just gets off frame is a pretty good one. You might think like, well, I should have planned that ahead of time, but sometimes it's better to animate just a little bit more beyond the end of the, the scene because then it doesn't seem like everything comes to a stop or there is no more detail. Now we sort of believe that there is more going on after it exits frame because there literally is. We were animating it. Okay. So at about this point, I would call this done and say that's a, an appropriate approximation of the ball that I saw on video. I know that some of you may want to know uh, what I would do in this case, and so I'm going to demonstrate it anyway. But just know that if you're doing homework for me, this is not a part of the homework. I'm going to show the curves one more time, and also I'll save my file at this point to preserve my progress. What if we wanted it to move three-dimensionally across the floor instead of just two-dimensionally? What if we wanted it to wander backward and forward because my floor was uneven, and that's what actually happened in my scene? Um, how would we try to add that? Could we just add it to the Z channel? Yeah, we totally could. Could we add it to the Z channel and could we rotate the Y channel to aim it appropriately? Yes, yes, we absolutely could do those things. Let me add that right now as an extra layer of detail just to show you what I would do. I'm going to start at the beginning by angling it a little bit back three-dimensionally. And I'm going to key rotate Y. And then I'm also going to be moving backward and so I'm going to key translate C. Okay, so both of those things. And in fact, I'm going to change my translate controller to be world again, because I'm not going to move this one. So I want it to go straight back. So I'm just going to leave that. Okay, so that's our starting position. That means it's going to go back into the scene a little bit. How far and when? Let's have it by this second impact here, I'm going to have it hit an extreme of how far back into the scene it's going to go. And by this point, it will have rotated back to flat again. Okay, so that should, there we go. And we've got default tangents for those new things that are being keyed. Now for the rest of it, I'm going to have it come all the way down. all the way down to here, just a little bit in front of that neutral line. And also I'm going to key the rotation. So here we go. And that one is already keyed. So we have this kind of wander. Okay, but I do need it to aim in the middle of that motion in the direction of travel. So there I've set a rotation key, but no position. Okay, so that is flat because I keyed that. Here it's in the direction of travel. Here it's coming back to flat again. So it does this sort of S curve. Okay. How much is this going to affect the animation from the side? Not very much, but it, don't, it will give it a little bit of extra personality. Now let me clean up those actions that I just animated. So we've got rotate Y now, looking kind of interesting. And we've got translate Z. Now, there's very little I need to do with Translate Z. I think the only thing I would do, well, what happened? Translate Z, Collection Tool. Hmm. 
I think it's because I pinned some things. It's kind of freaking out a little bit. I'm going to unpin those. There we go. So I'm just going to set this one to be linear instead so that it starts in motion, reverses, and then comes to a stop. This one's completely fine. I do want that one to come to a stop. And then rotate. So it's starting in the position I set it to and slowly coming to this position, which is zero because it's hitting a extreme angle. We might actually want to clamp that one, okay? So it comes to, it eases into that stop now. I know it's weird in the middle of a graph like that, but it might actually be appropriate to linger on that value. Then it gets into this transitional value, reverses, and comes to a stop on that one. So it's pretty weird to look at, but this could be correct. Maybe not. I mean, it's reversing. It could smoothly reverse from one angle to the other. But I sort of like how it's looking in the top view there. And we'll see how it plays. That should be that's all, all that's required, really. Let's look at it at an angle to see if we can even notice it. Yeah, and if we had lights and shadows in the scene, it might be even easier to view. But yeah, now it seems to be kind of S-curving its way through the scene a little bit, especially at the end here is more visible. But that's just an example of the way I would handle sort of animating that extra third dimension. Um, the way I, appro I approached it was by rotating to face forward without ever affecting X or the, the spin of the ball. That's the, the takeaway, where it would be much harder to initially on this spin controller say, well, I've got to spin that way, so I've got to spin both this one and this one at the same time animate them together, and then try to deal with the graph editor being a lot messier. That's what I wouldn't recommend. Or having two values that you're moving at the same time, so both X and Z, and trying to appropriately position it and ease all of those positions, that would be a lot harder to do. So try to avoid those situations. Treat your animations a little bit more two-dimensionally initially, and if you can be clever like that and add a third dimension subtly, it's better to do that sort of thing. All right, so if you're able to do all of those steps and not including the final one where I was just kind of showing off um, a potential way, then you're able to animate a bouncing ball from video reference. This process shouldn't be abandoned once you're animating more complicated things. In fact, you should use it more the more complicated the thing is that you're animating. This is a very easy example in a classic animation scene of a bouncing ball, which is something to practice on. But when you're animating, let's say, athletes doing, you know, amazing athletic things, getting your timing information from footage like Olympic footage or competition footage can be a great way to get your initial placement on the timeline. And then you can exaggerate it from there. Or even a comedian delivering stand up. The timing of jokes is very specific. The timing of jokes is very important. So if you animated a comedian voice line and didn't get their inflection and their accents with their head or their hand or their facial expression popping at the right moment, you might miss a joke and not be able to make it as funny as the original person. So don't think that this is just a one-time deal where you do this amount of work and then abandon it and never do it again. You should uh, use this amount of work whenever you're unsure, whenever it's something unfamiliar that you don't have a strong plan for. If you need the reference, look at footage. Film yourself if you have to or find good appropriate footage of someone who's professional doing that thing or of objects moving around. As you gain experience, you won't need to do that anymore. You'll be able to make appropriate guesses, but that's because that stuff has become simple. Whenever something is complicated, look for the reference. Okay. I hope that your animation works okay. Um, ask questions in comments if you need to, and I will see you in the next lecture.